because their idea was if only you le lived decent, quiet lives, everything would be all right. You see, you didn't want to flaunt it. So we used to flaunt it and upset them. And so there's all that great drama going on about um, you know, people demanding a place to live because there was a... Uh, by the way, the Lambeth housing list, there were thousands of people on the housing waiting list. And of course, we were all as poor as church mice. None of us had any money. Few of us had jobs because at that time, the employment was quite high. We're talking about the 1970s, late 70s, when the economy was pretty to on its knees. Oh, thank goodness for the Bricks and Gay Centre, or else I would probably have been stuck in a you know poky little boat bed sitting. Wimbledon living on my own as a miserable gay man forevermore. I mean, the first few days, I remember the first party for 155 Railton Road was absolute uh, dynamite. I can remember my pup, Papa was a Rolling Stone being played and everyone just dancing around in circles. We thought um, capitalism was was in was downfall was in, imminent it was coming to an end and we're on the brink of something quite dramatic and revolutionary which we were it, which we were this was serious gay liberation front politics uh, so that was um, happening there and then but we thought change was happening on a national level for a moment we thought everything was going to change globally even, but uh, not to be. Um, um, should we start with the with the gay centre thing? Or okay, sure, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, well, the thing was the the gay centre grew out of South London GLF. Uh, South London GLF started meeting in the library about 1972. Um, and then the sort of radical queens um, said, let's squat an empty building, you see. And this caused a furore because the conservative people thought this was, you mustn't do that. Anyway, we went ahead and did it, which meant that one or two people left. I'm still friendly with one of them, but he was a bit conservative and didn't approve of squatting. <laughs> and that's how we started the Gay Centre. Well, we wanted to be more public. You know, we were having public dances and things in the church crypt and, and the town hall and things, but... Um, we, we wanted something that was more public and it was so we squatted this building in Railton Road and had it open as a sort of drop-in centre. We had a coffee bar, you could go in there and be given a cup of coffee and we used to have um, events in the basement, um, discos and uh, it was great controversy because there was a thing called the Gay Wrestling Group and the gay wrestling group wanted to meet in our basement and the political purists didn't approve of wrestling. <laughs> of course, they were all queens. I mean, they were just getting their hands on one another. It wasn't really aggressive wrestling. Uh, anyway, we, we overrode them and they were allowed to meet in the basement and they had all these dirty mattresses on the floor which they used to wrestle on. <laughs> so that was fun. Oh, because the 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 right two hundred percent political right ons thought wrestling was um, very macho and disapproved of it on principle. Right. You see, there was a disapproval of kind of macho behaviour. Yes, of, you know, of being real men and heterosexual and all that sort of thing. Um, it was disapproved of by <laughs> by fairies. <laughs> And we had a telephone, which was like a sort of early version of gay switchboard. Um, 
Oh, no, have you heard of a thing called icebreakers? Well, um, a lot of us were in icebreakers. We had these stickers we used to put all over the place in phone boxes saying Homo homosexual men and women can ring icebreakers every evening of the year between 8 and 10 o'clock. Occasionally you got giggling. You'd find kids had read this and dialed the number and then giggled at you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's nothing terribly planned about this. We we just sort of thought it was a good idea. You know, it was a whole. Uh, well, let's t let's start with the gay centre first, because that 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 was really the focal point for more gay people to move into the area and squat more houses. So that's really a good point to start um, th to start thinking about that. Um, the I mean, the gay centre sort of was there for several reasons. Um, one was to provide an alternative um, place to meet for you know whatever activities you want to get involved in um, in contrast to the commercial gay scene which was actually very limited at the time and it was actually not particularly friendly to, to gay people it's just there to basically to we felt to rip people off um, so we wanted to provide an alternative social centre um, and but also secondly, um, in line with a lot of other groups that were in and around Railton Road, we really wanted to put down our own marker and say that we've got a right to exist as a social group as much as anyone else. So it was about it was at the beginnings of saying, well, we want to create our own space, um, and <clears throat> we want to demand that as a right right not not something that is um, provided by someone else uh, on a sort of a grace and favor we're saying we want our own um, self-identified self-identified gay space um, and thirdly it was also a place that we could run various uh, political campaigns from so it has those three functions the social the political and um, our coming out, if you like. Terry Stewart, ex-Gay Liberation Front, 1975 to 1984. And I was involved in like, running the Gay Centre. And from that, the Gay Centre was very much the hub of a lot of the politics of GLF South London um, emanated from there. And it was a, quite, a, quite a political hub and a social hub as well. Uh, very, very important to people in terms of meeting up with other lesbian and gay people and discussing the issues of the day. And of course, we were all as poor as church mice. None of us had any money. Few of us had jobs because at that time, employment was quite high. You're talking about uh, the 1970s, late 70s, when the economy was pretty on its knees. And of course, the the British economy had been uh, hopped off to the uh, the World Bank, so it wasn't an easy time. So squatting in terms of having somewhere to live was vital in terms of young gay people coming to London. It was somewhere you could live. We couldn't afford to, to have housing at that time. But certainly we wouldn't be known as openly gay people living in rented accommodation. Landlords wouldn't have been too happy to have years for ten years. Um, so it was, a, it was a means of um, being able to live during that economic downturn, as it were, in a reasonable, uh, in a reasonable way, along with gay people. And also, remember, we were able to develop our political ideas about who we were, what we were hoping to achieve. And um, it was vital in terms of personal growth and growth of the, 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 the LGBT movement of the day. Yeah, I should mention the other alternative groups along Railton Road. I mean, there are a lot of them. There was the People's News Service, um, which was um, an alternative news service to the uh, bourgeois press, <laughs> straight press, two women's centres. One was actually next door to the gay centre. Around the corner uh, from Railton Road on Shakespeare Road, there was the um, Race Today uh, Collective, a, 
<coughs> which is a group of black radicals. There's a food cooperative um, that was slightly f further down, just off Railton Road on Atlantic Road. But bearing in mind, not very far away, there were two streets of fully squatted houses. One was at Villa Road and the other was St Agnes Place. We had this idea that um, besides uh, you know, providing um, a social space for gay people, we wanted to try an alternative way of living. So we had this idea of actually um, chucking out the notion of private property. Uh, so we, had, we, we noticed that the garden walls were, were splitting people into different units. So we thought, get rid of all of that, right? Um, so that it becomes the property of all the gay people in those squats. It became a proper home for us. So you'd often come down in the morning and someone was making homemade bread. Uh, somebody else was sitting and having a cup of tea, having an argument about something current. And uh, it was... It was a nice space. It was a welcoming space and it was um, a space where we were able to grow. Now in 1976 we had one of the hottest summers. So that our time was spent in the back garden, arguing, debating, developing ideas, drinking cider. Um, most of our life was in and around the flats, uh, around, the, around the squats. Uh, but we did uh, go to local social areas as well, like just down the road from us there was a, it was a front line and a lot of the clubs were like black shabines. I went into one or two of them, I had no real difficulty with them but again it was a straight space. And then we discovered this woman called Pearl and Pearl had a space which was another shabine but it was a gay shabine. And uh, Pearl would often welcome you in. Uh, my name is Ginger. She called me Ginger for some reason because I'm not Ginger, I'm blonde. Uh, and we had a great time there. And that was a space away, for, even though it was like her private little shabin. It wasn't a commercial space. It was a local space where the black gay community came together with the white gay community. It was predominantly black. And um, there was a great sort of camaraderie between people. Brixton by this time was, um, you know, had a lot of Afro-Caribbean, a uh, large Afro-Caribbean community, and yet the Brixton squatting community was almost exclusively white. Had two, a, a black guy from, a couple of black guys from Portugal lived there for a short time, but no local um, black um, squatters, black gay squatters joined. In a way, these men came together because they were all gay. But I think what you start to see playing out is how other identities and identifications were also very important. So class or ethnicity or nationality, um, or whether they had moved from outside London or within London. All those kind of previous life experiences and identifications were at least as important in the way they lived in those squats as the fact that they were gay. Um, so I think there's something really interesting about somewhat deconstructing gay identity and saying, well, it's not necessarily the primary identity. You know, it might be as important that these men were white, for example, in terms of the way they thought about um, their experience there. Because what had happened or what was happening was that the idea of a distinctive gay identity, if we think about gay identity, it was perceived as a white identity and often as a white middle class identity. So a lot of black queer men in Brixton, and there, were, there was a black queer community there, there was a illegal bar, there were cruising areas and so on. But those, a lot of those men were not negotiating their sexual identities in quite the way these white squatters were doing, who were making a very explicit, explicit statement about their sexual identity, which was often much harder to do for men who were, were negotiating a place within family and community and church and, and so on. Um, so I think there's some really interesting things to observe, both about the inclusions that the squat enabled, but also the exclusions, who was, was kind of excluded, not, not deliberately or meanly or maliciously, but just 
by the fact, by the kind of politics and the kind of identity that was being, um, being coming into shape there. There was no physical violence. The only physical violence we had was from a white man who was very, very screwed up. And he used to come in and ask us what we did. And he'd get very drunk. And he came in one day and he went berserk. He smashed a chair and started hitting people with it. I said I nearly killed him actually because I he had his hands around S Philip's neck and Philip was going green so I, I hit the bloke on the head with this broken chair leg and luckily because if you do that you can kill somebody if you hit them in the wrong place luckily I only knocked him out <laughs> yeah we did get hassled there was a youth club that was fairly close which is run in the which is run in the Methodist Centre and of course, when the youth used to come out of that centre, they would attack the, the gay community most every night they came out. But we went up and engaged with the, the youth workers in that centre, and there were predominantly young black men who were involved in that, and talked about the need for them to stop this harassment going on. So, invariably about nine o'clock, half past nine at night, we would get bottles thrown, people shouting abuse, homophobic abuse, and then it would die off. And then there was other occasions when we'd have people come in. We had one guy come in one night who was actually not black at all, he was Greek, came in with a machete and set about trying to attack people in the, in the gay centre. And of course, our relationship with the police was a similar relationship that the black community had with the police. We couldn't trust them. Uh, the only time we ever met them was when they were either harassing us or arresting us. It was uh, a point of conflict. It wasn't a point of... Uh, call the old bill, they'll come to the rescue us. That, that didn't exist. And then some of the times when we did call the police, uh, whilst we were the victims, we were made to feel that we had uh, brought it upon ourselves. And I remember being firebombed on one occasion, and uh, the police came along and said, oh, it's just a quiz, and drove off. There was no attempt whatsoever to address that a criminal act is taking place, because at that time, we were just as scum of the earth. <laughs> it sounds like I'm sitting in the mastermind chair saying that. Um, yeah, I'm Edwin, Edwin Henshaw, and um, I lived in various houses uh, at the same time for different things uh, around uh, in Brixton and Railton and Mail Roads between 1976 and 1978. There were there were certainly these strands of um, kind of ethos and values about how, as liberated gay men or queens or faggots or whatever we want to call ourselves, um, there were certainly kind of those strands of of uh, of thinking around about how people should live their lives. Um, but you know, it was all very in constant argument and debate and people had different views about it and and so forth so it was all uh it was all kind of uh, slightly fraught but very creative at the same time kind of melting pot of i don't know high energy arguments bitchiness yeah. Yeah. but also great things going on at the same time so it was it was a very it was it was incredibly engaging yeah. thing, but also it was quite stressful to be honest. Course, yeah. You know, coming out was a big issue, I guess, in those days. Much more so, probably much more so than it is now, uh -huh. because in those days there was no there was no positive media portrayal at all of of gay people. Mm. It was all pretty negative, or very negative. And um, so, you know, in terms of making a, a statement to kind of stand up and be seen and say, you know, this is who we are, this is what we're like, um, you know, that was a big part of the ethos of what yeah. gay liberation was about. Drag was very um, prominent at the time because that was gender bending, gender fuck, gender bending. 
Um, the idea again of just enjoying yourself and dressing up as you want to, you know, putting you know a bit of slap on and a bit of few feather boas and whatever. The ethos of gay politics in those days was um, not to mimic heterosexual um, style of life. Um, so. In some ways, um, gay couples were frowned upon by other people, other gay men who were living there, because you know that, you know, you might, you're not supposed to try and imitate what um, straight people are like. You know, they're they're the people we're trying to rise up against. See, I, I think the view would I don't I don't know whether straight people ever did visit the gay community centre, um, but you know, the, certainly the ethos would have been very powerfully that this is our sacred space. So why would they ever be there? It's, it's like, you know, um, we're not on show to anyone when we're here. This is our place. And uh, it's hard enough for us to find somewhere that we can just be comfortable to be ourselves and yeah. not be exposed, if you like, to the, whether it's the derision or the uh, patronising attitude or whatever it might be, that, that you know, the gay community said it would not be somewhere where people would, yeah. you know, exactly. willingly expose themselves to that. So if, if there ever were any straight people who visited the gay centre, I think they would have been exceptional people. There was this kind of view that in order for us to find our identity and, and uh, be able to feel strong in the world, we needed the support of being self-contained in some way, that we needed a, a kind of nucleus of, of, uh, of protected space where we could be who we were. I think, I think people, people uh, there, was, there, was, there was also a lot of people who, who were involved in, in things outside of that community, but I think, uh, you know, and they would go there and they would probably get involved in argue, argue things and put views in, in those other kind of contexts, but it was going on within that community and that community was, was held to be, you know, safe space. Except that actually, of course, there was huge amounts of infighting going on within it as well. But, but, but that was often creative. I don't, I don't want to, to pick that as, as a negative thing. It had its negative aspects, but it was also highly, yeah. highly creative. And there's huge amounts of things like theatre and, you know, political action and uh, lots of stuff that came out of that place because, you know, because of what was going on within it. My um, intention um, originally was to get involved in the gay centre and political activity around there. And within a couple of weeks, I wanted to get involved in the whole squatting thing, an alternative lifestyle. And ev I'm, I arrived in about October, by November I had my own squat, that quick. Most of the people there I knew politically anyway, I met Bill Thornycroft when I was in Gay Liberation Front Office Collective, we were also members of the Communist Party, me and Bill Thornycroft. In fact, we co-founded the Communist Party LGBT group. Oh, that's another interesting thing. The Communist Party was the first political party to have a comprehensive LGBT policy and that, a lot of that was again drafted by people like Bill and myself. How did Brixton Fairies come about the name? We were called Gay Liberation South London. Um, uh, Colm and myself and a few others decided we ought to have a theatre group. So the first bit of theatre we organised, Colm, um, gave me a lot of help during doing Pride and we decided to, as part of Pride, to have a, a Brixton Fairies theatre group. That's where the name was used for the theatre group. And it was a Punch and Judy show and it was um, supposed to be street theatre that was highlighting homophobia and sexism. So um, the person who squatted above me, Alistair, who was fairly flamboyant, extremely camp, was Mr. Punch. And I was his oppressed wife, Mrs. Punch. 
and my partner to be was um, our son who came out as gay and we also had to introduce anti-capitalism we had a John Bull figure and Paul Newton as Britannia being pushed in on a wheelbarrow um, rule Britannia your Britons are such fools Britons always 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 shall be slaves is the um, a uh, uh, theme in which they were wheeled in. It was just to make um, this was a bit of street street theatre to make some um, points. Um, but bricks, the name bricks and fairies began to be used as the name for the activists and theatre group. It, it became the name adopted by activists. With Gay Liberation South London being sort of a more formal political part that um, would negotiate with the council or negotiate with the police or negotiate, that became the formal part, if you see what I mean, with Bricks and Fairies becoming the direct action part of it. Uh, this is how I saw it. The Gay Centre was also important as it, as it was uh, the basis for all kinds of politics. Um, when Gay News was being um, prosecuted, the National Gay News Defence Committee started there. And me and my partner at the time, Stephen, were joint secretaries of that. So a lot of things sprung out of it with um, quite a really big national... Um, um, importance. W.H. Smith had um, decided to refuse to sell the uh, gay news, the gay newspaper, and usually after a gay pride march people just disappear and um, not do very much, but uh, it was all, everybody was saying, well, we'll tell you what to do after, you know, after the speeches. At the end of at the end of the um, march, and because um, this was it was in Trafalgar Square, and it says there's a there's a W H Smiths just down the road. You know what you think of W H Smiths, and then everybody just moved down there, and um, yeah, I don't think anybody got arrested. I'm not sure, but uh, basically we pulled the place to pieces and <laughs> scattered the books and magazines all over the floor, and. Um, yeah. It's things like that, organised at short notice, just uh, so people don't know what's happening. We got um, a van hired, Martin, who wasn't part of the gay, who's now again sadly deceased, who lived in West London. We had um, a minibus and drove all the way to the outskirts of Colchester and went to Mary um, Whitehouse's um, residence. Mary Whitehouse being the moral campaigner who brought this um, private prosecution and it was around Christmas time and um, we sang a number of um, carols. I rang a bell, the door was left slightly ajar for some reason, and we sung A Gay in a Manger and uh, Jesus Wants Me for a Bum Boy and um, that, and, uh, and the, again that got into the press. It was uh, quite a good um, um, profile raising thing. And we sung similar songs during the campaign, during the large um, protest marches around Gay News. We had um, a lot of influence. Ken Livingstone, in one of his uh, early, auto, early autobiographies, um, said we were one of the most influential groups. And in fact, um, he gave a speech once which was put in the front page of the Evening Standard. It was given, the speech was given to something called SLAGS, the South London Area Gay Society, and he said, if everyone did what bricks and fairies would do, um, uh, our rights would arrive very quickly, because we're into direct action. You know, Sutherland Gay Liberation, Sutherland Gay Centre, there were, you know, there were one or two others at the time, but that, that was the one, I think, you know. There, there was, I think there was another one, grew up in North London, another one in East London, kind of in the wake of it, not so prominent, perhaps. And then, you know, that would have laid the ground for, for example, the, the Gay Centre in the 90s that was, that was more legitimised and 
had proper funding and was run as a uh, as a business it would have had funding from not quite sure where but the one that was in Farringdon um, for quite a few years end of the 80s beginning of the 90s uh, you know it sort of laid the ground for for that kind of setup So the thing about squatting, it, it's it, absolutely priceless. Um, without it, none of that would have happened. There, there would have been no uh, Brixton gay community. Of that, I'm clear. Um, there would be none of all of that creativity that came out of the Brixton gay community. That's clear. Without, without squatting, that would not have happened. We would have remained isolated in our bedsits, or with our families, or Maybe uh, you might scrape together a household or two, um, but um, that was just such a, you know, a saving grace that we were able to squat. The place I felt most at home and the place, uh, and it's still the only place I felt most at home was the squats in Mail Road and Railton Road in Brixton. That's where I felt the most support, um, the most, the greatest ties of love and affection. I miss it greatly to this very day. I've got such uh, very warm memories of it and uh, that long hot summer leading up to the Pride March sort of out in the back gardens playing Ella Fitzgerald's um, or oh, Cole Porter songbook all of us sort of in sort of various stages of nakedness you know just lying around the back gardens well it's all one huge garden or park nearly by then you know um, no I, I, I seriously miss them seriously miss them and I've come nowhere near repeating it since. We've come fragmented. When we were a, a strong, powerful community, we've come fragmented with all of that going. And the reason a lot of that went was because some of us died. Uh, Gary, Cole, Alistair. But uh, yeah, if I could turn the clock back, 